Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ida Lupino and Paul Henry in Now Voyager with Dame May Whitty and Albert Decker. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Amid all the hustle and bustle of these rough days has come a love story so fine and moving that it's gone straight to the heart of America. It's Warner Brothers' distinguished motion picture, Now Voyager. Co-starring tonight with Ida Lupino, we have one of the most sensational newcomers Hollywood has seen in many a day. He pronounces his name Paul Henry. He and Ida Lupino have just finished the picture Devotion at Warner Brothers. And tonight... You'll also hear two of Hollywood's finest character players, Dame May Whitty and Albert Decker. Ida Lupino's part is a challenge to any actress, because in Now Voyager, she really plays two women, the girl who lives under the domination of her mother and the woman who learns to meet love on its own terms. I believe this play has a universal appeal, and so apparently does the product behind it, Lux Flakes. Take this letter from a flyer in Egypt. Out here, we do our own dobe. That means laundry. Our heating apparatus is a four-gallon gasoline tin cut in half and about four inches of dirt put in the bottom. All you have to do is pour in a little gasoline until the dirt is soaked. Toss in a match, put your water tin on top, and there's your hot water. I was scrubbing away, sitting on a bomb tin with a wash tin full of dobe, trying to get the stuff clean. And I did it, too but I bet it was mainly due to what I was using. Luck. Yep, they even have that out here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way it's done in Egypt. The stove sounds a little uh, explosive to me, but he's on the right track with Lux Flakes, and we're on the right track with a play like Now Voyager. And here's the curtain for Act One, starring Ida Lupino as Charlotte Vale and Paul Henry as Jerry Durrance, with Dame May Whitty as Mrs. Vale and Albert Decker as Dr. Jackwood. Untold once, by life and land ne'er granted, now Voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I heard those words for the first time from Dr. Jackwood in my room at his sanatorium. I knew what he meant. I'd been there three months, and now I was cured. I was well again. But how could he be sure? How could I be sure? I wonder what Dr. Jackwood thought of me the first day we met. The time he came to our house. I remember the way he stood in the drawing room, smiling at me so gently. And I, in my low-heeled shoes and my glasses, fat and dull and sullen, not trusting myself to speak. And my mother. It was not my mother's idea to bring Dr. Jackson to see me. My mother believed only in strength, never in weakness. What was it she said that day? Oh, yes, she said, I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. It was Lisa's suggestion to bring Dr. Jackwood here, not mine. Your sister says that your recent peculiarities, your fits of crying, indicate that you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Is that what you're trying to achieve? Well, Charlotte, has the cat got your tongue? Mother, please. Be quiet, Lisa. Charlotte, Dr. Jackwood has a sanatorium in Vermont, I believe. Probably one of those places with a high wire fence and yowling inmates. Mrs. Vale, I wouldn't want anyone to have that mistaken notion. Cascade is just a place in the country. People come there when they're tired. The very word, psychiatry. Charlotte, doesn't it fill you with shame? There's nothing shameful in my work, Mrs. Vale, or frightening or anything else. You see, Miss Charlotte, people walk along a road, and they come to a fork in that road, and they are confused. They don't know which way to take. I just put up a signpost saying, not that way, this way. Well, Charlotte? Would you like Dr. Jackwood to point the way for you? If you should want me, I shall be in my room. Charlotte, come back here at once. Please don't. I'd like to speak to her alone. Excuse me. Oh, Miss Charlotte, will you wait, please? Yes, Dr. Jackwood. Miss Charlotte, I wonder if I might ask you a favor. 
Will you be nice enough to show me around this house? One doesn't often get a chance to view the Vale residence. Very well, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Here is the room in which I was born. My mother's room. You may look at it if you like. It's a fine room. But I'd rather see your room. I'd rather see what your room is like. I'm not your patient yet, Doctor. Well, now, nobody thinks you ever will be. Of course, if you'd rather not. It's on the floor above. When I was 17, I stayed out once until after midnight. That creaky step hasn't been fixed since. I'm not sure I know what you mean. My mother heard it. This way, Doctor. I keep my door locked. Make a note of it, Doctor. Significant, isn't it? Well, it signifies it's your door. I've never heard it said that a woman's home is not her castle. My castle, Doctor. Well, you're comfortable here, aren't you? Yes, I try to be. I'm here a good part of the time. Hello. What's this over here? A work table? Yes. Ivory carving. Did you make this cigarette box? Why shouldn't I? The point is how you could. I have a real admiration for people who are clever with their hands. I was always clumsy with my own. I would say that you are one of the least clumsy persons I've ever known. You may have one of these boxes if you like. May I, really? Thank you very much. Yes, I'll get you something to wrap it in. Don't bother. Oh, you wouldn't happen to have a cigarette hidden away someplace, would you? Hidden? Do you think I hide cigarettes in my room, Doctor? No, no, I mean... Where do I hide them, Doctor? On the shelves behind the books? Cigarettes and medicated sherry and novels my mother would never allow me to read? Please, it was only the box that reminded me. How very perceiving you are, Doctor. How very right you are. You see, I was about to hide this album. You really should read it. It wouldn't do for you to have come all the way up here and missed your amusement. Read it, Doctor. The Intimate Journal of Miss Charlotte Fayle, Spinster. Won't anything convince you that I do not wish to pry? Oh, but you must pry. I insist that you do. Now, here's the record of my last trip abroad with my mother. We were sailing up the coast of Africa. You wouldn't have known me then. I was 20 then, and I was in love. Miss Vale. Oh, don't be embarrassed. I'm not. There's his picture. Isn't he handsome? I'd never met a man like Leslie before. I'd hardly even met a man. Mother saw to that. I had to wear simple girlish frocks and flat shoes. And my glasses. I was never allowed to take off my glasses. You'll never get another pair of eyes, my mother used to say. But Leslie loved me. Yes, he did. He told her to marry me. But you see, he was only the radio officer, and he wasn't good enough for a veil of Boston. He wasn't suitable, my mother said, so she smashed it up. And what man is suitable, Doctor? She's never found one. What man would come along and look at me and say, I want you. I'm fat. My mother disapproves of the polderols of diet. I wear these shoes. You see, my mother approves of sensible shoes. I am my mother's well-loved daughter. I am her companion. I am her servant. My mother says, my mother, my mother, my mother. Oh, here now, look up here. <laughs> You'll never get another pair of eyes, as your mother says, if you spoil them with tears. <laughs> Dr. Jackwood, can you help me? Help you? When you were talking down to me, when you talked about the fork in the road, there are other forks further along the road. So many. You don't need my help. Put away your book and come downstairs. I'll go ahead. Yes, doctor. It's just as I said, isn't it? Just not. Mrs. Vale. Charlotte's no more ill than, than a molting canary. Of course, she's my youngest, you know the child of my age, my ugly duckling. I suppose it's true that all late children are marked. Often such children are not wanted. That can mark them. Dr. Jackwood, are you telling me... I have been trying to tell you that your daughter is seriously ill, thanks to you. Thanks to me? If you had deliberately and maliciously planned to destroy your daughter's life, you couldn't have done it more completely. How? By having exercised a mother's rights? A mother's rights. Twaddle. A child has rights to discover her own mistakes. To make her own way, to grow and blossom in her own particular soil. <laughs> Are you getting into botany, Doctor? Are we flowers? I am trying to help your daughter. I suggest a few weeks at Cascade. I spent three months at Cascade. Outwardly, Dr. Jackworth had worked a miracle. I'd lost weight. I was looking better. My hands were steady. Inwardly, I didn't know. 
And then came that morning when Dr. Jackwood told me I could leave. The time has come for you to get out of the nest, Charlotte. Try your own wing. You mean go home? No. Go out and take a good look at the world on your own. Forget you're a hidebound New Englander. Meet people. Talk to them. But I... I'd be afraid I... Charlotte, the other day I referred to a quotation. Remember? Yes. She said it was from Walt Whitman. That's right. Well, I've had it looked up. He puts into words what I'd like to say to you. And far better than I could ever express it. He says, Untold once, by life and land ne'er granted, now, voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I sailed in a week, a pleasure cruise to South America. On the passenger list, I was Rennie Beauchamp. I stayed in my cabin most of the time. For the campus, I decided to go ashore. As I came down the steps into the tender, I felt people looking at me. They must have known my clothes had been borrowed. You might be able to fool your mirror by wearing lipstick and plucking your eyebrows. But you can't fool other women. They know. At the bottom of the ladder, a man was smiling at me. In a panic, I turned and started back to my stateroom. Excuse me. Yes. What is it? Excuse me, but uh, are you Miss Renee Beauchamp? Yes. Well, my name is Jerry Durrance. Uh, Miss Beauchamp, it seems you have the only, sh only shore carriage left. Uh, the steward suggested that you might be willing to share it with somebody. Well, really, I... I know it's an inconvenience. If it's too much, just say so. No, of course not. If you can stand it, I think I should be able to. Thank you. Do you like rum drinks? Yes, these are very good. I've enjoyed myself today. Have you? Yes. You know, Miss Beauchamp, you're quite different from what I expected. How am I different? Well, you're so much more comfortable to talk to, Miss Beauchamp. So much... Please listen. I'm not Miss Beauchamp. I beg your pardon. Renee Beauchamp is out in Arizona somewhere. I took her space at the last moment. I... I don't know why I'm telling you all this. It's stranger. <laughs> no. You are the stranger. You know who I am. I'm sorry. My name is Vale. If it ever appears on the passenger list, it will be C. Vale, Boston, Massachusetts. One of the Vales of Boston. One of the lesser ones. Well, which one? Miss or Mrs.? It's Aunt. Every family has one, you know. But Aunt what? My name is Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. Do you mind if we go? Uh, Miss Vale, I hope I didn't offend you. It's like me to blunder just when I was going to ask you for a favor. I have some shopping to do for my daughters, and, well, I need a woman's help. Why, of course. A spinster aunt is an ideal person to select presents for young girls. Miss Vale, I, I wish I understood you. He wishes he understood me. He wishes. You know, I think we did very well. The jewelry is just right for Beatrice. And the sweater for Tina. How old is Tina? Here, uh, I have a picture. Uh, this is my harem. All girls. Oh, I see. Who is that missing? Oh, that's uh, Isabel, my wife. The picture isn't very good of her. She'd only looked up and smiled. That's Beatrice next to her. Then that must be Tina sitting cross-legged on the grass. Yes. We hope she won't have to wear glasses all her life. Tina wouldn't smile for me either. She's convinced she's an ugly duckling. Does Tina know she wasn't wanted? That's an odd remark. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know why I made it. I mean odd because it hits across the truth. Even before she was born, her mother said... Never mind that. Here. Here's a slight offering for being my guide today. It's a mixture of uh, several kinds of flowers. It's called Jolie Fleur. Thank you very much. I'll put some on my handkerchief tonight. Will you? Good. Uh, let's meet in the bar for a cocktail before dinner. Hello. Hello. Won't you sit down, Miss Vane? You made a striking impression over there as you stood in the doorway looking for me. Yes, I... Probably put on too much lipstick. No, no, not that I noticed. But I didn't notice the rap at once. Oh. What's that? What's what? Something on your app. Why, it's pinned on. A note. <laughs> Somebody must have been playing a joke on you, I guess. Would you unpin it, please? Read it. This cape always makes an impression. 
I hope it will do the same for you. What does it mean? It means that this cape belongs to Rennie Beauchamp. She lent it to me. Oh, I see. Your wings are borrowed. Well, they suit you just the same. No, they don't. They don't suit me at all. In fact, that's perfectly ridiculous. You're quite right, you know. Someone is playing a joke on me. And it's far funnier than you realize. You aren't going, are you? Yes, if you don't mind. Well, Jerry. Mac. In depth, too. How are you? Hi, Jerry. We're joining our ship. Wonderful. Oh, uh, these are my old friends, Deb McIntyre and Frank. And my new friend, Miss Beauchamp. How do you do? How do you do? Is this Rene Beauchamp? No, no, another one altogether. Uh, this is uh, Camille Beauchamp. Excuse me, please. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait, Miss Beauchamp. Uh, see you later, Deb. Sure. Please, wait. Why did you run out on me? Did you have to introduce me like that? It wasn't up to me to, to let the cat out of the bag. Did I do wrong? Why did you call me Camille? Well, it was the only French name I could think of, besides Fitty. I suppose that's meant to be funny. My wife calls my life and moments trying to be funny. But I intended a compliment. In that dress, you were rather like a Camille. Yes, likely. You haven't a very high opinion of yourself, have you? No, perhaps this will help you know why. You showed me your album. I really must show you mine. A picture of my family, you see? <laughs> family is right. <laughs> Who is this, your grandmother? No, my mother. A very strong character, I'd say. And these? My brothers and their wives. But they're so much older. Uh, who is the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair? Spencer Aunt. And where are you? Taking the picture? No. The fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair. I'm poor Aunt Charlotte. And I've been ill. Yes, I, I've been in a sanatorium for three months, and I'm... I'm not well yet, and I... <laughs> Forgive me. Of course. Feeling better? Yes, much. Thanks to you. Oh, many, many thanks to you. Thanks for what? Oh, I don't know. Sharing my carriage today. Walking my legs off sightseeing. Helping me feel that there were a few moments. Almost felt alive. Thank you. Thank you. Who? Thank you, Jerry. days, I learned about Jerry Durrance and his life at home. It was his friend Deb who told me. Deb talked a great deal. And I think what a woman like Isabel can do to a man like Jerry, it makes me bored. Her martyrdom and her jealousy. She can't have any reason to be jealous. If you mean does Jerry have flings with other women, no. But mostly she's jealous of Tina. The child? Yes, the child she never wanted. And so I found out but he was unhappy, too. And then one evening in Rio, our car broke down on the mountainside. He told me that night he'd been an architect once. But the only work he really loved, his wife had asked him to give it up. We talked all night, Cherry and I. Toward dawn, I lay down beside the fire he had built. When he thought I was sleeping, he leaned over quietly and kissed my cheek. My boat sailed without me. The next night, back at the hotel, we stood on the balcony looking over the harbor. You can rejoin your cruise in Buenos Aires. There's a plane going down there first thing in the morning. And there's another plane going down in five days. You'll get there the same day as your ship. Oh? You know anybody in Buenos Aires? No. It seems a shame to rush down there to spend five days alone. But you'll be busy here. Oh, my business can wait. And we did start off for a tour. Yes. If we started off at somewhere. If I promise to sit at a different table in the dining room and say, Good morning, Miss May. I hope you slept well. So people will hear me and never guess that I'm head over heels in love with you. Will you stay? 
Don't say no, Camille. Say, I'll see. I'll see. I must go in now. No, no. Not yet. Look at the harbor. Isn't it beautiful? You believe in immortality? I don't know. Do you? I want to believe that there is a chance for such happiness to be carried on somehow. Somewhere. Are you so happy, then? Close to it. Getting warmer and warmer, as we used to say as kids. <laughs> Remember? Look out or you'll get burned, we used to say. Are you afraid of getting burned if you get too close to happiness? Oh, mercy, no. I'm immune to happiness and therefore to burn. You weren't immune last night on the mountain. You call that happiness? Only a small part. There are other kinds. Such as? Having fun together. Getting a kick out of simple little things or out of beauty like this. Sharing confidences you wouldn't share with anybody else in all the world. Charlotte. Won't you be honest and tell me that you are happy too? Since that night on the boat when you told me about your illness, I can't get you out of my mind. Nor out of my heart either. If I were free, there would be only one thing I want to do. Prove you're not immune to happiness. Why, darling, you're crying. Oh, Jerry, I'm such a fool. Such an old fool. These are only tears of gratitude. An old maid's gratitude. Don't talk like that. You see, no one ever called me darling before. Well, there's my train. Yes. Thanks so much for the flowers, Jerry, and... I hate goodbyes, don't you? They don't matter. It's what's gone before. No, it's what can't go on after. But we'll see each other sometime. No, Jerry, we promised. You know, we're both to go home. Will it help you to know that I'll miss you every moment? So will I, Jerry. So will I. The press an orange. The press is an orange. Goodbye. Darling. Goodbye. Goodbye, Jerry. Goodbye. Goodbye. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Ida Lupino and Paul Henry with Dame May Whitty and Albert Decker in the second act of Now Voyager. Meantime, here's our friend Libby Collins and an old tune to introduce a new showing of wartime clothes she'll tell you about. Thanks, Mr. Kennedy. I wanted the Arkansas Traveler as a kind of salute to the star of our clothes show. She's a lovely girl from Lepanto, Arkansas. And she's certainly been doing a lot of traveling. Her name is Bonnie Beth Byler, the maid of cotton for 1943. Bonnie Beth is traveling around the country this spring to show how smart and serviceable cotton clothes can be, how to make them last longer through proper care, and how easy and inexpensive it is to have just the kind we want when we make them ourselves. Oh, so this is a make-it-yourself fashion show. Yes, it's a save-by-sewing, save-more-by-luxing show. We call it Luxable Cottons for Active Service. The clothes are really lovely, and every single one of them is luxable. There's a stunning wide world corduroy suit, a slack suit and smart beige herringbone, some adorable date dresses, and a whole lots of other kinds. They've all been luxed over and over, but they're still fresh and new-looking. Where is the show now, Libby? This week, Bonnie Beth is in Baltimore and Boston. And next week, that's National Cotton Week, she'll be in Brooklyn. After that, she goes to Philadelphia and other important cities. The store where she appears and the time of the show will be announced in the newspapers. I do hope a lot of you will see the show. You can copy any dress in it for ever so little, and ever so easily, too. They're cut from McCall patterns with a printed cutting line, and on each pattern there are hints to help you do a really professional job of dressmaking. And for a hint on care, you'll find it pays in longer wear to stick to new improved Lux Flakes for all your washables. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act One. 
act two of Now Voyager, starring Ida Lupino as Charlotte and Paul Henry as Jerry, with Dame May Whitty as Mrs. Vale and Albert Decker as Dr. Jackwood. Early in May, I returned to New York and went at once to see Dr. Jackwood. He was delighted with the change he saw in me, but even he didn't know how much I changed or why. The final test was still to come when I went home to see Mother. I stood there outside her room, my heart beating wildly. In my mind, I kept hearing Dr. Jackwood's words. Just remember that honoring one's parents is still a pretty good idea. You're going to be a shock to her, and I advise you to soften the blow. Give her time to get used to you. Hello, Mother. So, you've decided to come back. You're looking very well, Mother. Lisa told me you'd been ill, but I... Lisa knows nothing about me. Step over there where I can see you. Now, turn around. It's worse than Lisa led me to suppose. Much worse. Well, you'd like me to go, Mother. Don't go. I have things to say to you. I've asked a member of the family to dinner tonight at 7.30. That's very nice of you, Mother. There'll be Lloyd and Rosa, Lisa and June, Mr. Livingston and Uncle Herbert. You mean Elliot Livingston? Yes. I shall be wearing my white lace gown tonight. I'd like you to wear your black and white foulard. Oh, but, Mother, I've lost over 25 pounds. It won't fit. There's something else I want to say to you. Now that you've come home to take up your duties as a daughter again, I've dismissed the last nurse. I've become used to having a room occupied on the same floor with me. And in view of my heart, I agree it's a wise precaution. You will occupy your father's room from now on. I had William move down all your things yesterday. But, Mother... You have no right to move my things. No right in my own house to move what I see fit. Yes, but, Mother, I think if you wear your glasses tonight, you'll be less of a shock to the others. And take off whatever you've got on your face. As to your hair and eyebrows, you can say that often after severe illness one loses one's hair. But you're letting yours grow as quickly as possible. Very well, Mother. If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go to my room. I knew then there had been no change in Mother, or in the house, or in me. But that evening, some flowers arrived. His flowers. A tiny box of camellias. Charlotte? Yes, Mother. What are you doing in your old room? I had my things moved back. I'm going to sleep here. Didn't you understand I wished someone to sleep on the same floor with me? We can get one of the maids, Mother. Perhaps Hilda. So long as I pay the bills, I'm running this house. Please remember, you're a guest, Charlotte. Well, if I am one, then please treat me like one, Mother. Your guest prefers to sleep in this room, if you don't mind. This is no time for humor. Where did those flowers come from? From New York. Who sent them? Well, I've forgotten the name of the florist. In other words, you don't intend to tell me. Oh, Mother, I don't want to be disagreeable or unkind... I've come to live with you again, here in the same house. It can't be in the same way. I've been living my own life for a long while now. It's impossible to go back to being treated like a child again. Where did you get that dress? I bought it in New York today. It's outrageous. Where's the black and white foulard? Well, I gave it to Hilda. She was so grateful. Oh, Mother, please be fair and meet me halfway. They told me before you were born that my recompense for having a late child was the comfort the child would be to me in my old age, especially if she was a girl. And on your first day home after six months' absence, you behave like this. Mother, wait for me. I'll go downstairs with you. Thank you. I prefer to go alone. Mother, please. You know you're not supposed to. Mother! Mother! Dora, come here. She fell. My mother fell. She was not badly hurt, torn ligament in her leg. But it was enough to keep her in bed during the party. I was a great surprise to family that night, and as they left, one of the guests stayed on to speak to me at the door. Elliot Livingston. Well, Miss Vale? Well, Mr. Livingston? You know, I still can't get over our not having met. Well, as a matter of fact, we have. Once and almost twice. I'm mystified. Well, when we were children, you were the only boy who danced with me at dancing school. And the almost was when you were supposed to usher at my coming out party and didn't show up. <laughs> I'm covered with shame. Well, I shouldn't have told you. It wasn't nice. Well, I... Uh, I hope you're going to allow me to make up for my past rudeness. May I telephone you sometime? Of course, any time. 
Good night. Good night. How is your ankle, Mother? Extremely painful. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been doing some thinking as I've been lying here in pain, listening to you all having a good time downstairs. How much did that dress cost? Well, it was frightfully expensive. I'll tell you about it in the morning. To whom did you charge it? To whom I've always charged my clothes, Mother. And do you expect me to pay for articles charged to me of which I do not approve? Well, I could pay for it myself. Save quite a little money. About $5,000. $5,000 won't last very long. Especially if your monthly allowance were to be discontinued. Oh, I see. Solid. I'm willing you should occupy your old room until I dismiss the nurse. That will give you a good chance to think over what I've said. I'm very glad to give a devoted daughter home under my roof and pay all her expenses, but not if she scorns my authority. Well, I could earn my own living, Mother. As a matter of fact, I've often thought about it. I'd make a very good head waitress in a cafe, or I could... Mm. You may think that very funny. But I guess you'd be laughing out of the other side of your face if I did carry out your suggestion. I don't think I would. I'm not afraid, Mother. I'm not afraid. Summer, winter, and then spring again. Between Mother and me, there was a sort of armed truth. In her own way, I think she respected me for what she called my stubbornness. And then there was the matter of Elliot Livingston. Why haven't you accepted Elliot? Do you imagine there's a Livingston waiting for you on every corner? Well, I've been waiting to see how you'd feel about it, Mother. You know as well as I do that it makes no difference to you how I feel about it. You always do exactly as you please. <laughs> I think you're pleased. I'm nothing of the kind. I'm only so astonished that you of all the family should bring such a feather to the family cap. Well, then if you really do approve, Mother, dear, why... Oh, keep all that soft talk for Elliot. Oh, Mother, there's no one like you. That night I told Elliot I would marry him. Our wedding was set for June. Mother was pleased, and well, I was too. And then three weeks before the wedding, I saw Jerry again. In a room full of people I saw him, and it was just as if we'd never been apart. What's the matter, Charlotte? George, I... I think I know that man over there. Oh, Jerry Dern. He's been doing a job for me since March. Architect for the medical center. Shall I tell him your name or let him guess? Oh, let him guess. Right, come along. Oh, Jerry, here's someone who thinks she's met you before. Yes? Oh, of course. You do look familiar. Don't tell me your name, George. I've, I've got it. Beauchamp, isn't it? Camille Beauchamp. I'm sorry, Jerry, but you're wrong. No, my name is Vale. I met you on a pleasure cruise once. Oh, yes, Miss Vale. I hope you'll forgive me. I'll leave you two alone to make your own tea. George tells me you've been in Boston quite often, Mr. Durrant. And I didn't know. Yes, several times. You look simply glorious. An architect? Oh, Jerry, I could cry with pride. I've wanted horribly to call you up. I've walked by your house on Marlborough Street. Once I almost rang the bell. Oh, Jerry, why didn't you? Uh, tell me about Deb and Mac. You introduced me to them on the pleasure cruise, remember? They're all fine. And how is Tina? Well, Tina. We're having quite a bad time with Tina. Tell me about it. I'm afraid we've got to send her away somewhere. The doctor thinks she shouldn't be with her mother. I took her to see Dr. Jacklis. He was highly recommended to me by this Camille Beauchamp I mistook you for. Camille, I'm still horribly in love. Jerry. I must see you. May I come to your house tonight? I won't stay but ten minutes. I must talk to you. Yes, I, I'll be waiting. Hello? Hello, Charlotte. Jerry, why didn't you come? I've been home for hours. I'm sorry. I'm leaving tonight on the midnight. But why, Jerry? I've got to get back on business. I heard the news. You're going to marry Elliot Livingston. Yes, Jerry, but I wanted to tell you. I just wanted to say that. I thought he was a fine person. And... Jerry, where are you now? I've got to see you. Oh, Charlotte, no. I think it's best that we don't. Are you at the station? Goodbye. Jerry. Jerry! Jerry! Wait. Charlotte, you shouldn't have come. I had to, Jerry. 
I wanted to talk to you about Elliot. Why are you marrying him? Are you in love with him? No, not like we are. Not like us. I thought it might grow to be something like it. I thought I was getting over you, Jerry. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. You're not angry with me, are you? No. Only with myself. It was rotten of me to make you care. Then because of some noble sense of duty to leave you to get over it the best you could. And there isn't a thing I can do about it. Isabel depends on me more and more. She's ill and getting worse. And there is Tina. Even if I could chuck everything... I wouldn't let you, Jerry. I knew you were married. Walked right in with my eyes wide open. But you said it would make you happy. And it has. I've got back my work. And that's due to you. Oh, Jerry, I... I've been hoping you'd say that. I have more understanding for Tina. I'm even kinder to Isabel. So don't blame yourself. Then don't you... It's different. No, it's not. Shall I tell you what you did for me, Jerry? You made me feel important. You were my first friend. And then when you fell in love with me, I was so proud. And when I came home, I needed something to make me feel proud. And then your camellias arrived and I... I knew you were thinking about me. Oh, darling, I could have walked into a den of lions. As a matter of fact, I did, and the lions didn't hurt me. So please take back what you said. If you can marry that man and have a full and happy life, I will. I'll try, Jerry. I look for you around every corner. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, darling. I did try. I wanted to marry Elliot. It was no use. We broke it off by mutual consent. And I knew then I would never have a home of my own, or a man of my own, or a child of my own. Why did you break the engagement? Because I don't love him, Mother. Have you no sense of obligation to your family or to me? Here you have the chance to join our name, Dale, with one of the finest families of the city. And you tell me that you're not in love. You're behaving like a romantic girl of 18. Yes, I don't doubt it. And what do you intend to do with your life? Oh, I don't know. Get a cat in a parrot and live alone in single blessedness. I think you'll be ashamed to be born and live all your life as Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. You've never done anything to make your mother proud. Nor to make yourself proud either. Dr. You... Jack would say, tyranny is sometimes an expression of the maternal instinct. If that's a mother's love, I want no part of it. Oh. I didn't want to be born. You didn't want me either. It's been a calamity on both sides. Oh, oh. oh mother, oh. mother, let's not quarrel. We've been getting along together so well lately. It was a horrid thing to say. Forgive me. Mother. Mother! What's the matter? Dora. She was sitting there and, and we quarreled. We quarreled. I did it. I did it. Before Mr. DeMille presents Act Three of Now Voyager, starring Ida Lupino and Paul Henry, with Dame May Whitty and Albert Decker, here's some inside information for the women in our audience. Some inside of the house information to help you spruce up your home for spring. Did you know that when you wash painted walls, you should use a sponge squeezed almost dry so it won't drip and streak? Make light luck suds and wash a little at a time. Rinse with clear water and dry with a clean cloth. But stick to gentle Lux flakes for the job. Don't use strong soaps. As a government bulletin says, soaps containing free alkali can be as harmful to paint, varnish, lacquer, and linoleum as they are to your skin. There's no harmful alkali in new improved Lux. You can safely use it for flat-painted walls and woodwork, for washable wallpaper, for cleaning stoves and refrigerators. You can give your furniture a beauty bath, too. Dip a soft cloth in lukewarm Lux suds. Wring it out and wash the surface of the wood thoroughly. Take a clean cloth and rub with the grain to dry it. Then your furniture will take a beautiful polish. Always Lux blanket all your washable woolens before you spray them and pack them away. Clean things aren't nearly so tempting to moths, you know. Be extra careful not to rub or wring woolens, because rubbing is one of the things that's most apt to shrink them. That and strong soaps and hot water. But you don't have to worry about strong soaps when you're using new, improved Lux Flakes. It's the mildest, safest Lux ever made. Its suds are richer, more cleansing, and they're longer-lasting suds that do more work. Thrifty to use for every soap and water job you have to do. 
It's at your dealers now in the same familiar blue box. New, improved Lux Flakes. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. We'll have a confidential little chat with our stars after the play. Now the curtain's rising for the third act of Now Voyager. Starring Ida Lupino and Paul Henry with Dame May Whitty and Albert Decker. I did it. I quarreled with my mother and it killed her. I couldn't shake off the feeling of guilt. It grew worse and worse until at last I had to get away. I went back to the only refuge I'd ever known. Back to Cascade. How are you, Miss Vale? Dr. Jack required you were coming. Hello, Trask. I'm tired. Think I could go to my room right away? Of course you can. Come on. How's Jack with? Oh, the same as ever. Handing out common sense instead of sympathy. Wait a moment. Who is that child, Trask? Girl at the table. Christine Durant. A problem if I ever saw one. Tina Durant. Jerry's child. She sat alone over a picture puzzle. Her eyes dull and staring behind her glasses. Her plain little face tightened into an expressionless mask. I went and stood beside her chair, but she turned away from me. Hello. What's the picture supposed to be? I don't know. Well, do you mind if I join you? I'll collect all the pink pieces. I know who you are. You do? You're my new nurse. No, I'm not. You can't fool me, and I know why you've come here. Make sure I don't run away from this place again. Oh, did you run away from here once? You see, I didn't know. What's your name? You know my name. That's why you stood there and stared at me. Oh, that was very rude of me. But you see, you reminded me of somebody. Who? Well, if you must know, myself. Of course, at your age. Christine, your schedule calls for you to spend the evening with the young people next door. They don't want me. Oh, nonsense. Of course they want you. I've got a fine ping-pong game all fixed up for you. Barbara and Betty against you and Bob. But, but, but he's the best player here. And I'll be the worst one. I'll die, I'll just die. Now, you'll do nothing of the sort. <laughs> oh, please, 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 don't make me. Don't make me. Oh, don't make me. Now, Christine, <laughs> don't make her talk. But the doctor wants Christine to have exercise in the evening. Well, I'll see that she has some exercise. I can take my car down to the town and leave it at the garage to be washed. Christine will go with me. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Christine, oh, but please I... let me go with this lady. I'll drink all my cocoa tonight if you will. For goodness sake, Christine, don't carry on. Go get your coat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Trask. I couldn't help you. I thought you were too tired to do anything but just crawl into bed. Well, I suppose Cascade has performed another miracle. Tina's room was next to mine. Late that night, I heard her. Tina. Tina, what's the matter? No, don't be afraid. What is it, Tina? Don't leave me. Don't leave me. No, I won't till you're asleep. Now, come on, tell me what's the matter. I'm ugly and mean and nobody likes me. Tina, you... I'm not pretty in the least. And they hate me. They all hate me. Who are they? Everybody. All the kids at school. And the strats and the nurses and the doctors. Oh, there must be something awfully wrong with me. Do you like them, Tina? No, I hate them. That's the trouble. <laughs> if you want people to like you, you've got to like people. I bet you're only fooling me. Well, you try it and see. And in the meantime, if it'll help you, any, I like you. And I think you're very pretty. And very sweet. You do? Really? Really. Now, oh, come on, don't cry anymore. Why are you so good to me? Oh, because somebody was good to me once. And I needed somebody. Go to sleep, Tina. Close your eyes and let your muscles go all limp. There. That's better. Much better. Jerry's child was in my arms. Jerry's child was clinging to me. Jerry's child. Even I don't believe it. You've done wonders for that child, Charlotte. Dr. Jackwood, I have a proposition to make to you. I want to take care of Tina. Pay attention to her. Make her feel wanted and important. 
I'd like to take her camping in the woods. You know, she adores camping. Take her home to Boston with me. If she wanted to come, of course. Sounds like a wonderful break for her. Dr. Jackwood, how much do you remember about my trip to South America? Well, you sent some beautiful postcards. No, no, that's not what I mean. About an automobile trip I made. And the man who was with me. I never knew the gentleman's name. You never told me. Well, I'd better tell you now. It was Tina's father. Tina's father? Does that alter the situation? Of course it does. I don't know anything about your relationship with Durant. I don't know how emotionally involved you are with him. Well, I'll tell you everything. It's over. That's it in two words. And Tina needs me. Well, you see, I, I've never been needed before. Well, I'm crazy. But if you promise to behave yourself... Oh, thank you. But you're only on probation. Remember what it says in the Bible. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> How does it feel to be the Lord? <laughs> Jerry had to be told, of course. And though we never saw him, he sent a message through Tina. He asked her to thank me. And then came the time when we returned to Boston, and the house was filled with young people. There was laughter and fun, and Tina coming down the stairs in a new dress and her hair all curled. And Jerry standing there with his eyes full of love for a little girl. Tina. Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Can this be Tina? Do I look nice? My first party dress. You look lovely. Do you really like me? I love you, darling. Tina, don't you think it'd be nice to show your father your room and your studio and everything? Would you like to see my room, Daddy? Very much, if Miss Vale will pardon us. How long are you going to call her Miss Vale? What should I call her? I don't know. Would it sound too funny if you called her my name for her? And what name is that? We decided it on the camping trip. I call her Camille. Camille. I think it would sound very nice indeed. Jerry, what are you doing here all alone? Come and join the party. I want to speak to you, Charlotte. Yes? What about Jerry? I've decided to take Tina home. Take her home? Oh, but Jerry, you can't. Dr. Jack would I don't care what he says. No self-respecting man would allow such self-sacrifice as yours to go on indefinitely. Oh, Jerry, that's the most conventional, pious speech I ever heard in my life. I can't go on forever taking, taking, taking from you and, and giving nothing, darling. Oh, but, Jerry, you will be giving. You'll be giving me Tina every single day. It's very kind of you to put it that way. Well, then, is it something Tina has said? Don't you think she's happy here? Happy? She told me upstairs she loved you almost as much as she loves me. Well, Jerry, what is the reason? Is it something about us? Of course it's about us. Why didn't you marry Livingston? I tell you why. Because I came along and ruined him for you. And now my child comes along and claims all your attention and takes your whole life when you should be trying to find some man who will make you happy. Some man who will make me happy? Oh, so that's it. Here I've been laboring under the impression that you and I were so insensitive. So one that you'd know without being asked what would make me happy. And you come up here to talk about some man. Jerry, you haven't the slightest conception of what torture it is to love a man and be shut out, to be always an outsider in an next Charlotte. When Tina said she'd come and stay with me, it was like a miracle, like having my own child, a part of you. I thought you'd understand, Jerry. But evidently you don't. Again, I... Than just a sentimental fool. It's a tendency I have. Wait a minute. I was afraid you were keeping Tina out of pity. But there was no pity in your ridicule of me just now. Now I know you still love me and it won't die what's between us. Do what you will. Ignore it, neglect it, starve it. It's stronger than both of us together. Please let me go. Oh, Charlotte. Jerry, listen. Dr. Jackwood knows about us. When he said I could take Tina, he said, you're on probation. Do you know what that means, Jerry? He allowed you to come here as a test. And if I can't stand the test, I'll lose Tina. And we'll lose each other. Darling, please help me. Shall we just have a cigarette on it? Yes, please. May I sometimes come here? 
Whatever you like, Jerry. It's your home, too. And there are people here who love you. To look at you and Tina. To share with you peace and contentment. Of course. And it won't be for this time only. That is, if you'll help me keep what we have. You could come here often. We could talk about your child. Our child. Thank you. And will you be happy, Charlotte? Oh, Cherry. Don't let's ask for the moon. We have the stars. Before our stars return for a curtain call, here's one of our real-life stories for you. It happened to Mrs. Irving C. Cobb of Fairfax, Vermont. Seems she'd been struggling with, and doing a bit of grumbling about, the hard water they have in her little farmhouse. I, I guess a lot of you understand how she felt. Well, one day Mrs. Cobb found she didn't have any of her regular dishwashing soap powder left, so she tossed a little Lux into her dishpan. And here's what she writes us. I was surprised and enormously pleased to find I had real suds. Suds that stayed suds, too. That was something that never happened with my other powders and flakes. So no longer do I have excuses for grumbling over hard water. I'll use Lux for baths, shampoos, as well as dishes and laundering, for everything that calls for soap. Yes, new improved Lux flakes solve a lot of soap and water problems. Whether you have hard or soft water, give you wonderful suds in any kind of water. Rich, long-lasting suds, too. And very gentle suds. Use Lux for dishes, for the million and one things you do every day. It's thrifty and ever so much better for your hands. You'll find it in the same familiar blue box, but it's the new, improved, better-than-ever Lux Flakes. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. The two voyagers of now Voyager are taking a little trip back to the footlights. Ida Lupino and Paul Henry. I believe this is Paul's first curtain call in the Lux Radio Theater, Mr. DeMille. Now, I'm willing to guarantee right now there'll be many more. Very kind of you, sir. You know, Ida... The first uh, time I met Paul was at an air raid warden's meeting. <laughs> I feel safer already with you two on the job. And, of course, my husband in the Marines. Well, that, that brings up a social problem, Ida. <laughs> uh, that, that must concern many women these days. When you go somewhere in the evening, do you go alone? Or do you have an escort? I suppose a, a date is the modern word. Well, sometimes I have a date. Confidentially. What does Louis think of that? Oh, I only go out with friends of his, and he approves. For instance... Well, uh, don't keep us in suspense. Well, I had one date the other night with my favorite jitterbug partner, Monty Woolley. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I often visit the Henrys. Paul's wife is charming, and they have a lovely home. Henry Fonda and his wife build it, Mr. Lemire. You should get a look at Paul washing dishes at the Hollywood canteen some night. <laughs> You know, I think he's had some experience. Have you had any more adventures at the canteen, Ida? Well, the other night I danced with a sailor. And when the dance was over, he said, Would you do me a big favor? I've seen all your pictures, and there's just one thing I wish you'd do. What was it, Ida? Miss Lupino, he said, Would you please scream for me? <laughs> <laughs> you really made an impression. <laughs> uh, what's the play next week, Mr. DeMille? Well, I'm, I'm sure it'll be the talk of the town, Paul. Oh, that's fine. Uh, but what's the name of it? That's it. The Columbia Picture Success, The Talk of the Town. And our stars will be... <laughs> Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm quite excited about it myself. It's a thrilling story that, that has comedy, drama, and romance, plus three great stars. Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman. <laughs> I'll wait right here so I'll be sure not to miss it. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. We'll book passes with ship mates like you any time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today is the birthday of an enterprise that's doing its part to bring victory nearer. It's the first anniversary of the USO Boston... Soldiers and Sailors Buddies Club, where over a million men and women of our armed services have found a welcome in the home city of our sponsors. It's a great comfort to those of us who have sons and daughters and brothers and sisters in the service 
to know that thoughtful men and women are extending hospitality to them wherever they go. To this club in Boston and to all service clubs, we send our congratulations and good wishes. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman in The Talk of the Town. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The picture, Now Voyager, was produced by Warner Brothers Studio, whose latest release is the production Mission to Moscow. Dame May Whitty appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and will soon be seen in the picture Slightly Dangerous. Albert Decker's next picture is the Harry Sherman production, Buckskin Frontier. Heard in tonight's play were Mary Lou Harrington as Tina, Fred Mackay as Elliot Livingston, and Dwayne Thompson, Anne Duran, Claudia Dell, Charles Seal, and Stanley Farrar. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Cary Grant, Gene Arthur, and Ronald Coleman in The Talk of the Town. Mothers, are you worried about food rationing and shortages? Yes, it's harder now to get vitamin-rich food. But have you thought about giving your family VIMS? VIMS are scientifically designed to help make meals complete. They give you all the vitamins government experts...